Father, again, as we come to the last session of our meeting this evening, we plead that we might find rest in Jesus Christ. Time is so short, Lord, and our greatest need is fellowship with thee. Abide with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What we're going to do, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to answer any questions of what we've gone over that may have been pressing to us. We've raised enough questions. and We'll take a few questions for a few minutes, and then uh, we'll go into the final part where it breaks down what is taking place today. I believe that if time is short, we need to understand it and know what to do about it. Amen? Now, I know we're not going to exhaust it, but we're going to give us enough that we can see what's happening in the handwriting and what we need to be doing by the grace of God. We have an annual end-time retreat that we do every year, and it's going to be in August. This next one, I pray that all you could be in attendance. Amen? At the end of these meetings, we will have cards available uh, that would let you know about that end-time retreat that teaches these things and gives us more time to get into the nitty-gritty. Amen? Uh, so we want to do that. Also, if anybody is interested in staying in contact, if you would just write us your name and your address uh, after the meeting is over, we do send out monthly packages whereby we can keep abreast of what's happening and what we can do to get ready, a monthly newsletter with, with, with CDs or what have you. Uh, so please, we want to press together. Amen? Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to take the time. I don't know if we have microphones. Do we have extra microphones here? Do we have that? Uh, if we have a couple, maybe two, uh, we can have somebody on this side and somebody on that side. And what we're going to do, we're going to ask the question. I only have three rules to this question and answer that we'll do for the next few minutes. And the first rule is that once you have a question, just stand up and state your question. Once you give your question, then sit back down and hand the microphone back. Amen? That's a simple rule. Is that simple? That's a simple rule. Number two, when you ask your question, make sure that the question is something that you yourself are interested in. Not a question because you're looking at your neighbor and you want to bam them upside the head. Amen? Ask a question that you yourself are personally concerned with. Don't say, well, I always wanted that person to know that, so I'm going to ask that question. Let's not do that. Let's keep this in an environment where we're pressing together. I think all of us need help. What do you say? I don't think anyone in this room can look at each other and begin to start saying, well, look at this and look at that. No matter what the problem is, we may have different problems, but we all have a problem. And our greatest need is Jesus. And if we can all come to Jesus, we can all meet at that place. Amen? So let's ask questions that we ourselves are concerned with. And then number three, if we can simply uh, make sure that the bottom line is not what we think or feel or what the church says, but the bottom line needs to be what does God say. That's simple, amen? For there's a way that seems of right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death, destruction, death. So if we do just those three things, we can have a wonderful time together. Is the rule simple? Okay. Let us pray and we'll go into the question and answer. Heavenly Father, we know that man is ignorant, that I am foolish, but thou art wise. We pray for the wisdom of God to envelop us today and give us your answers to our questions, that we might be ready and help many others. Bless us, we pray, to this end, and may we have the Spirit of Christ in this session where we are pressing together and pressing closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If there are any questions, I see a hand. We'll start at this side and we'll go back and forth. Well, let me see this sister. There's a uh, female sister and we'll come from back and forth. Um, good evening, Brother Pastor. Um, I wanted you to elaborate, please. My question is based on something that you said last night and um, this afternoon where you had said that something is going to happen in Maryland Maryland was the first state to um, vote for gay marriage. And you said Maryland is one of those states that's demonized. There's more demons in Maryland. If you could just elaborate more on that and what's going to happen in Maryland 
in terms of the economy and martial law. Thank you very yes. much for taking Thank our you. question. Thank you. Uh, we will reserve some of that toward the end because we're going to talk about that a little bit more fully. Uh, but right now, it's not just Maryland. Maryland, the reason why Maryland is so important is because Maryland is the wealthiest state in the nation of America. Uh, there are more millionaires in, in Maryland than any other city of America. And so as you look at that, you can begin to start seeing the, 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 the dichotomy or the, the, the division between the haves and the have-nots. We're going to find out that this plays heavily in prophecy. And this is very important. Now, if we're in the room, we don't want to be talking right now. Amen? And it's all outside to talk. I don't believe you came in here to talk. Uh, but as we look at that, we talked about why the demons in Maryland. We spoke of that a little bit earlier. We're showing that in Maryland, there's only one church that has a message from heaven that can finish the work, and that's the Remnant Church, according to the Bible. We found out that the Remnant Church has a heart or a headquarters. We found out the headquarters are where? In Maryland. We find out that what happens in Maryland affects the whole body of believers. That's what the prophet says. And so if there are more that can affect the world in Maryland, if you were the devil, where would you put the most of your men? I'll put them right here in Maryland to affect the entire world. And yes, the devil is doing that. But as we look prophetically, we want to understand that right now that there are, are laws that are coming into motion. We're told that while we're sleeping, that the enemy is arranging matters that, that will be without mercy and without justice in America. And what you see happening now, uh, there was a, 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 a something that is trying to be pushed into law, which is very interesting, where it starts talking about what other nations have to do that are receiving the monies from the United States of America. Have you heard about that? That they have to give a full detail of what their monies are being used for, how they're being expended, that ties them into a, an IRS in which nations have nothing to do with the IRS. And so what is happening is it's causing, uh, if that goes through, it's causing persons to begin, nations and other financial institutions to begin to start recognizing, look, we don't need the American dollar if it's going to do that. Let me tell you something. The only thing right now that's keeping the American dollar afloat as we're going to show you tonight, is the fact that other nations are carrying the American dollar. The, if anything could happen to cause nations not to use the American dollar, our money would, would almost go into hyperinflation overnight. And so what, what we are seeing is a law that was lending to that where nations will find it so much to have to do in order to use American dollars, and this law is supposed to go into effect in the summer of this year. And so there are people that are trying to fight it, but, but all of this is part of prophecy. Even if that law doesn't go into effect, the other laws are in motion right now. We're going to show you that ultimately it's going to happen to create a revolution. Are you with me? So that's going to start. And why Maryland? Because Maryland is one of those states, as we said, out, that are leading in this type of crisis. Maryland is heavy in technology. You know it's one of the most technolo technological states in America. And the same with finances. So it's, it's, uh, Maryland is strategically placed to be a city that the devil wants to take because what happens in Maryland happens around the world. That means that Maryland is a scary place to be in if you don't have Jesus. Amen? Now, if I were you, as we're going to see tonight, we need to get out of the cities. If you're going to be in Maryland, you don't want to be in a city in Maryland. You want to get out of the city into a retired place in the country because when this thing breaks... You want to be in a position where you can help somebody in the city, where you can minister to somebody in the city, but where you're not going to be trapped where God doesn't want us to be. And we've been told this over 100 years ago. We were told this. I say it's time to follow. Amen. Next question. Next question. There's a hand over here. And sometimes it's for the recordings just so people can hear as well. Just a real quick question. You don't, got to, you don't have to go on great detail um, you said we didn't really have time but if you get from my from my research if you could help me out when we spoke about the Pope um, and 600 years ago a, ro a Pope retired willingly if you could just elaborate a little bit more at least tell me you know so when I do some research I know what to look for like what, what okay. was it the Inquisition what, what, what time what period was that okay good good uh, 600 years ago of course that would take you to the 1400s and if you go back to the exact time in history you will find that that was the time that the Pope stepped down to allow the Protestant Reformation to begin. Wycliffe, 
you will see you happen at this time, the morning star of the Reformation. So that pope stepped down and it opened up a door for the Protestants to make a move to start the Protestant Reformation. The Reformation started at that time. We're living at the time now, 600 years later, and this has happened not to start the Reformation, but this has happened to end the Protestant Reformation. And you see immediately when this pope came in, you remember they started loading up all the Anglican pastors and the other pastors. He's been making trip to all the religious leaders and political leaders. And right now today, Protestantism, one man has said, and it's a reflection of all the Protestants today, but they said Protestantism is over, it's ended, it's dead. And so this is ending the Protestant Reformation. There's only one Protestant church left, which is Seventh-day Adventism. And Seventh-day Adventists is fast giving up the protest. Uh, we're told that protestism, it meant any church that was not Catholic who was supposed to be protesting against the idolatries, the indulgences, and the false practices that is not in Scripture that is being practiced in a church would be Protestants. Every other church is to be a Protestant that wasn't a Catholic who believed in the Word of God. But now and today, all these other Protestants have gone back to tradition instead of the Word of God. And Seven Adventists is sad to say, but many of us are going back to tradition instead of the Word of God as well. And so, but as Protestants is ended, we want to do our part to finish the work. Amen? Amen. Next question. Right here. I now let's, we, we, we're, on this, we're on this side now. We're going back and forth. And then we'll come right back to you, brother, right after that. If we can go this side, please, and then we'll come right back. Yes, I would like to know what state is the best state to live country life. Yes, uh, I will tell you that uh, there is no state in, a, uh, in the world that I would consider the best state. In fact, most of the states you're going to hell in, hell in. <laughs> I believe that the only state that's safe is the state of full surrender. Uh, when we, the state of fully surrendering our hearts to God. I don't care what state we're in. The question is not state. The question is more so the area, the country. In every state, mostly, you find country places. So God is not telling us that you have to move to the west, you have to move to the east, you have to move to the north, you have to move to the south, but he's teaching us of a condition of living that's just like heaven. When we go to the country, we're not going to the country to hide. Some, oh, I'm not going to hide, I'm going to be in the front line. No, you're not going to the country to hide. You're going there to develop character. See, when you're in the country, I'm telling you, there's nothing like sensing the presence of God. I, to see hummingbirds come and visit you while you're having devotion. To see what it's like when the stars are shining and there's no smog or the, the, the influence, the presence of God becomes more real. Then you have an experience that you can take back to the city. We're coming from a country outpost into a city to do mission right here. And I tell you something, it's almost like heaven. That's what the prophet says. And so God is not interested in necessarily we have to be east, west, north, or south, but it must be a country environment. And we'll have materials later on that talks more about what that means. Okay, next question. Yeah, um, you said earlier about the prophetic. This yeah, that's, what, that's what we're going to deal with just before we close. Okay, so you're going to have all the biblical. Yes, line of, okay. yes. Only reason why I say Praise God, praise God. Next question. Let's go on this side. We're, we're back on this side. We're, we're back on this side. Oh, excuse me, sir. Excuse me. We're back on this side, and then we'll come right back. Thank you. We'll come right back on this side after that. When the Pope take office, there yeah. is a lightning come to Vatican. Did you think this is a sign that... Well, that's what, that's what we were talking about right now. We're going to talk about that before it's over with. Thank you. Uh, she's talking about when the Pope came in. We're going to talk about that later on. Yes. Uh, we're on this side. Now, you, you can stay on that side for the next question, but we're coming to this side. We're trying to go back and forth because we, we're not going to be able to finish. Amen? All right. I was, I'm not sure if it is what true, but uh, I heard Pope's brother is a Seventh Adventist. If it was so then he has an idea of what Seventh Adventists believe. Now, if that is true, I'm sure he is going to do something about it. Do you have any idea? Yes. Uh, the, that is uh, normally believed because of an allegation of a, minister, uh, of a uh, uh, retired minister or ex-minister uh, of this denomination but we were over in, uh, in, the, in the Spanish country while he was also doing meetings. We were in the same place. And many of the people have found out that, that, that there's real no data, no documents, no historical information that proves that. 
And so I never try to talk about something that cannot be proven. And so that, that was more uh, fabrication than reality. Um, but it's true that the Pope does know about Seven Avenue. No question that he knows about Seven Avenue. There's no question about that. Uh, but <laughs> somebody would say that was a Jesuit. No. <laughs> I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters. The devil is tricky. He will use anything to distract us from that which is most important. All right, let's go to the next question. Go on this side. Uh, my question is on something you said about Adventists being lost, yet saving is still going to be going on. I Say again, I'm sorry. You said that, uh, I think it's when you said the squeezing or something like that. Adventists are going to be lost, yeah. and uh, but other people from other denominations are going to are going to be able to get saved. I, I am not understanding why that is. If God is merciful and and there are Adventists in there who really don't understand, why is He going to make us leave us? Uh, like no, I didn't. I didn't actually say that. I, I understand what you're saying. But what I was bringing out was what's in John chapter 10. Let's turn there. To the book of John chapter 10, let's notice what Jesus says in John 10. Jesus says, many sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them I must bring, and there will be one fold and one shepherd. What I was bringing out was just because a man is in the Seventh Adventist church does not make that man a sheep. And just because a man is in Babylon doesn't make him a goat. You can have sheep in Babylon and goats in the remnant church. So it's not that if you're in the remnant church, you're going to be lost. I never said that. What we're bringing out, that there's no safety ticket by just be sitting in this church that that's automatically going to save you. What we brought out, that you must be a sheep in the church if you're going to be saved. The goats are going to be lost whether they're in the church or out of the church. All the goats to the left and they're lost. All the sheep are going to be saved. And before God finishes, he's going to have all the sheep in one place. And so what we brought out was that there's a way that you can tell the difference between a sheep and a goat. You see, goats have something on the front of their heads. They got horns. You know what they do with those horns? You can tell a goat from a sheep. They butt with those horns, and you can see them in the church, because all you have to do when God says something, that God gives a rule or a principle and a standard, someone says, well, I know what God says, but, well, that's a goat. Someone says, I know what God says about diet and dress. I know what he says, but, well, you're looking at a goat. The difference is a sheep does something different. In John chapter 10, notice what a sheep does. The Bible says, beginning in verse 26, John 10, beginning in verse 26, uh, the Bible says, but you believe me not because you are not my sheep. He was talking to the chosen church, the remnant church of his day. It was the Jewish nation. He said there were many in the Jewish nation that were not his sheep. He says, as I said unto you, verse 27, my sheep do what? Hear my voice and they do what? And they follow me. So what we're talking about is if a man's in the seven minutes church and he won't listen to the voice of God as revealed through the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, if he won't listen, he's not a sheep, he's a goat. But if a man's in a Sunday church or he's not even going to church and he's willing to listen and respond to the word of God, well, that's a sheep that God's going to bring and then he will be saved. Do you understand? So it's not about being lost or saved just because we're in the church or out of the church. It's about our response to Jesus Christ. All right, next question. So on this side, I see a hand. We have a few more minutes. Um, when you were talking about clothes, you said that your skirt should reach past your knees. Should all of your skirts be like close to your ankles? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, and yes, it's a true question. All of our, you see, you must understand that everything that God gives us has both natural principles and spiritual principles. Do you know that we're told that in a hospital, if you had high blood pressure, the hospital would just tell you maybe something about diet, but they wouldn't tell you about dress. But even in a sanitarium, we would teach people that one of the reasons for high blood pressure is in the way we dress. Do you know that we're told that when we don't cover the extremities, that it makes the blood, guess what? Pump harder. That we're to equalize the clothing so that there's an equal pressure 
when the blood goes out throughout the body. And so we're to wear clothes that covers us until certain points where if you study physiologically, the veins and arteries change at the different ends of our body, whether it's the foot or whether it's the hands, you actually find that the veins and the arteries are made different in the hands and in the feet that are exposed to circulation much different. If you study the Bible prophecy, you'll find out that there's a bit covering. Adam and Eve, when they sin, their light went off that covered them. Remember that? The Bible says that they made themselves something out of fig leaves. You know what they made themselves? They made themselves aprons. Now, if you study an apron, you will know that the fashions of today is what the fig leaves of yesterday was. That they fashioned, you know the Bible says in Genesis 3 that they fashioned those fig leaves into? They made a certain type of fashion. You know what it was? In Genesis 3, you can read in your Bible in Genesis 3, the Bible says in Genesis 3, verse 8 and 9, that they made aprons. They made what? Do you know what an apron is? Do you know that if you study the history of aprons, you know the Masons are a secret society and they wear aprons. The Masons have been around since the Tower of Babel. They were the first uh, Masons. Secret societies, way back then, they traced it down to Nimrod. If you go back, they've been wearing uh, 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 aprons since then. And if you study, and I have, if you study through history on aprons, you will find that in nearly thousands of years, the apron has not changed, that they expose and cover the same things. Now, what does an apron expose? The apron, like a spaghetti strap, exposes the arms. It exposes the cleavage. It exposes the back. It exposes the hind parts of the body. It exposes the thighs and the calves and the legs. And God, number one, for health reasons, wanted us to be covered. But number two, also for modesty. When we learn to cover our bodies, then we can use it the way God says. Everything that's viable, we cover. Now, if you will be interested in learning some texts and also some other Spirit of Crossfit references and physiology that will help you, see me afterwards and I'll share with you a book that will make it helpful so that we can practice this. You see, God wants to teach us. You know, we're supposed to be taught this. We aren't to be condemned with this. Do you know that if we really were taught this, instead of looking at it as a burden, it will become a blessing. And that's all God wants. See, when a woman and a man really understand the blessing of this, it makes a difference. It opens up the door for ministry. It opens up the door because there should be a distinct difference between the way a child of light dresses, between the way a child of darkness dresses. The Bible says whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. Praise God. Now, okay, next question. I have two questions. So the first one is um, the events that occurred in Pasadena, California with Dr. Walsh um, being forced to resign from his position in the Catholic Church, speaking about him not being fit uh, to be a public health uh, leader. Um, do you see that having any prophetic implications specifically outlined in Great Controversy? So that's the question number one. And then question number two, do you see um, social media having any impact in not only in the pro proliferation of the gospel, but for us to have um, a, a platform or a footprint to really um, push religious liberty in America? Two good questions. Number one, we'll answer as uh, quick as we can the first. Uh, I'm not sure if you know about what happened in California. Are you, are you familiar with what happened? Uh, uh, if you're not familiar fully, then see me after. Amen. Uh, but those who do know, as you brought the question up, it has implications. He was also a worker for the public uh, uh, in the health care department. But as a result, the, really the LGBT got behind it, and they began to start pushing and pressuring him and made the persons uh, concede. In fact, and one of the things that was saddest, was that, that, that some of the church actually distanced themselves from him and said that we have nothing to do with his comments. You must understand something, brothers and sisters. We're living in a time when the, 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 the church will distance themselves from us sometimes we're taking a stand for Christ. Now, they distanced themselves from Jesus. Didn't they do that? They said, he, he's not Caesar's friend. They said, this man's an enemy of Caesar, and that put Jesus on the cross because the church distanced themselves and says, we have no king but that of Caesar. And that put Christ on the cross. But did Jesus turn from his church? No. Uh, he continued to do his part in it. So yes, it does have great implication in that it shows us that we're living in a time when we have to be willing to stand up and be counted no matter what the result is. What if some do not like the truth of the 30 years message? The Bible says we're going to be hated for, by all nations for my name's sake. What that means for us is we have to be willing. If we're going to be thrown in prison, it's going to happen anyway. We have to be willing now. And I remember going to a country that was heavily Catholic, and they told me before I entered, if you preach like this, you can be in prison. And I said, listen, the third angel's message must be preached. 
to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. May God help us now so we'll be prepared then. Amen? Amen. Now, can we do this without Jesus? No. But can he give us the strength to stand up and be courageous? Now, do you think if you are afraid to stand up in your local church that you're going to be willing to stand before the United Nations? We have to start making stands now. Now, the second question was talking about particularly using the social media as a medium to enter truth. Now, what I want to say about that is that the social media is a method in which God wants us to use. But you've got to remember, anytime you get on the way, uh, www, remember its name. You know what www stands for? World Wide Web. Worldwide what? Now, everything that happens in the natural has a spiritual application. Now, in the web, a web comes from what? What, what, what insect or, or amphibia? What, what, what does that? That's a spider. Now, you study through the Bible. Have you ever studied webs and spiders through the Bible? Interesting. I recommend it to you. The Bible says that the spiders, they throw their webs even in king's palaces. They're everywhere. So its web gets everywhere. All around the world, there's a worldwide web. But as you study through it, you'll find out that if you study naturally, a web has two parts to it. How many parts? Two. This is literal. I take some young people out when we're in the country, and we show them spiders' webs, and we let them see this so they can understand. And if you touch a spider's web, you'll find out that the web, they have a structure to the web, which is what he builds his web on, the outer structure of that web. And if you look at the outer structure of the web, it's amazing that if you go to the outer structure and you touch it, it's not sticky. You can put your hand on it and push it, and it won't even stick to your hand. You can just do like this. It's the structure of the way the web is. You'll see it. They build it first, the structure, like a foundation. But then the inside of the web, they make it a little different. They spin a second type of web. And the second type of web, which is the one that traps the insect, that's the web that is sticky. If you put your hand on it, it will stick immediately to it. And you can let the person see there's two sides. Now, the structure of the web allows the spider to get anywhere he wants to go. Are you following me? Now, the structure of the World Wide Web, the Internet, is good if you use the structure properly. It allows you to be able to talk to a man in Africa or China or Asia or the islands of the sea. It allows you to be able to get messages all around the world very quickly, but you must remember that there's a structure, but there's also a sticky part. And someone says, well, preacher, how do I know the sticky part? Let me let you in something very simple and clear. If you get stuck, you know which part you're on. If you find yourself doing anything on social media, whether it's an hour or two hours, and you spend more time with it than you do spending personal time with Jesus, you're on the sticky part. And you want to get off that part and stay on the structure. Amen? Use the structure wisely, but that sticky part, you better be careful because it can kill you. Next question. Okay, so um, basically, if rings are bad, based on it being a biblical stance, like in Isaiah 316, it says that God will take away the woman's rings, bracelets, etc. These are things of the world, right? Tradition. And so why do we wear suits and ties and hairstyles like we do? Well, the Bible teaches us that we're to cover and clothe ourselves. And the Bible says that we only reject something when it's in contradiction to the word of God. Uh, is there anything in the Bible that contradicts wearing a suit in the Bible? Now, there's a way that a man can wear a suit. Now, is there things that contradict wearing jewelry in the Bible? Yes. Uh, and God magnifies it with the spirit of prophecy. And the spirit of prophecy points out that there are several things that are directly tied in that would leave alone. The Bible and the spirit of prophecy point out jewelry. It points out wedding bands. It points out many of these things, but it does not point out the suit. Now, if a man doesn't want to wear a tie, there's nothing evil about that. If a man doesn't want to wear a tie, it's all right. If a man does want to wear a tie, there's nothing evil about that. If he wants to, it's to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in it. So I would just simply say, look to the word of God, and if there's something in your dress that contradicts the word of God, then be willing to surrender it. But if it's not in the Bible, then I don't push it. If it's not in the Bible, I leave that man the freedom to persuade and make his own decision. Amen? We're free, liberal, uh, we have the freedom of choice, but we want to make sure that our choices do not contradict the word of God. All right, next question. Considering the impending um, crash of the dollar and uh, our economy, uh, what would you suggest we do with our um, pension funds, a 401k? Because 
doesn't seem like we're going to be, have, be able to use it. That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, first, I would ask uh, to make sure that you have something. You might have been robbed and you don't know it. Uh, most people don't even have 401ks. Uh, that doesn't seem real right now, but you're going to see in a little while that, that that's very real. Uh, but what I would say to you is that while you have opportunity to intelligently go to God and ask, Lord, show me how to pull this money out intelligently and invest it the way God told us. You know, the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the coming of the Son of Man. You will find out that Noah invested everything he had. Do you know how much Noah lost in the flood? How much money Noah lost? Zero. In the book of Patriots and Prophets, page 95, the prophet says, everything that Noah had, he invested in the ark. That ark was that structure that was built by God's design that was to take him through the crisis. You know there's another ark for us to build spiritually that's going to prepare us for the crisis that's coming. Through a time when no man can buy or sell, all of our means today should be spent either in investing it in the end time ark that we must build to go through the time when no man can buy or sell, or being spent in giving to the ministry of God so that souls can be saved for the kingdom of God. The Bible says in Matthew 6 that we want to take our monies out of the banks of this earth where they corrupt, where the thieves break through and steal, and we want to transfer them and stock them up in the banks of heaven. Amen. There, the money will never go down. There, the bank industry and the economy is so good that the streets are paved with gold. I say that's a good economy. What do you say? <laughs> Praise God. All right. Now, let's come back over here, and then we'll come right back. Let's... There's no one over here? I, I see a young sister. We'll take a couple more questions, and then I don't want the time to get away from us. So we'll take a couple more questions. Amen? You want to take a couple more questions? All right. Now, if, if we can, it would have been good if we can use that. Okay, come on. You know how it says to, that we need to live in the country instead of the city? Well, does it specifically say in the Bible that you need to live in a house or just surrounded by nature? The Bible is very clear in the book of Hebrews. Let's turn to Hebrews. Because everything we do should be patterned after God. Amen. In the book of Hebrews, and that's a good question. Now, in the Garden of Eden, they didn't have to live exactly how we have. They made little bowls, little, they tied up little uh, uh, animal, uh, little, uh, 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 the, the trees and the nature together and made themselves little houses to just, just so they could live in. Uh, but when sin came in, the weather changed. <laughs> and you can know that's dangerous. When the weather changed, you, you need to make some changes too. Now, in the book of Hebrews, you'll find out something that the Bible says that God did in Hebrews 3. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 3, and notice what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3. In Hebrews 3, beginning in verse 3, the Bible says in verse 3, For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he who have what? Builded the house, have more honor than the house. Verse 4 says, For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is what? Did God build a house in heaven, yes or no? Does God have a house in heaven? Yes. And do you know that we're to do on earth what God does in heaven? He taught us to pray, thy will be done in earth as you do in heaven. Do you know we're told that in heaven, in the new earth, we're going to build houses and inhabit them. We're going to plant gardens and we're going to eat the fruit of them. And do you know that if we have not learned the beauty of building houses now, we'll never enter into the joy of it then. So yes, we're going to build houses in fact, Spirit Prophet says there's going to be some beautiful houses. And the one in the city, the ones in the houses in the city in heaven, uh, it says that they're going to be made almost like it says, it says that it's going to be pure silver. We think we did something when we came up with stainless steel appliances. Can you imagine silver houses? I mean, I'm telling you, it's going to be beautiful. You know how it's going to be in heaven? Look, you talk long enough, you're ready to transport tonight. But heaven says you can't go up there until sin is out of us. Amen? Praise God. Let's walk and get closer to Jesus, all right? Is it okay for men to wear shorts or only long pants? Are you speaking of men or yourself as a young man? <laughs> because I, I just want to make sure you're men answering asking boys. the question. Men and boys. Okay, let's go to Psalms. Now, the reason why I say, men, we ask asking questions that concerns us. You know, it's amazing. Sometimes uh, the enemy will, will, will sometimes use and distract other things. But if you're sincerely asking that question for you, I'll answer the question. You're sincerely asking that question for you? No one told you to ask that question. Praise God. Let's look at this. Look at Psalms. In Psalms 147, 
We want to notice what the Bible says in Psalms 147. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. You know, there used to be a song that they used to sing. They don't sing it so much today, and I understand why, but they used to sing a song, You Can't Go to Heaven in a Bathing Suit. You know why? It says, because the Lord don't think those legs are cute. Now, in Psalms 147, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 10. The Bible says, he delighteth not, talking about God, he delighteth not in the strength of what? The horse. He taketh not pleasure in the legs of what? Of a man. He doesn't want to see your legs. He doesn't think those legs are cute. He wants those legs to be covered. And so when you study physiologically, you understand why. We're told that many young men, especially young people, catch major diseases because they leave their extremities exposed. And so it messes up the circulation. And so it's important that we understand the importance because perfect circulation means perfect health. We should be improving the circulation. All right. Uh, let's take one more. Let's take, let's take one, two questions. Then we've got to bring it to a close. Now, now look, we, we at, you're giving me questions. Amen. So if we're here to midnight, it's not my fault. <laughs> All right. Let's take one question over here, sister. Yeah, are you going to talk about country living? Because I live alone, and I want to be in the country, but I can't. Yes. Well, you have to know this principle, and that's a good question. Somebody says, well, if I live alone, what do I do? The book of Psalms, uh, the, the 68th division. Let's turn to Psalm 68. What does the Bible say about that? In Psalm 68, the Bible tells us, what if a person lives alone, but they recognize that God's call is to get out of the city into the country? The Bible says that Babylon is a great city. Is that what the Bible says? The Bible says in Revelation 14, 8, the second angel, he followed them saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Revelation 18 says, come out of her, out of Babylon. So that means that this is not only calling us out of the false churches, but out of the cities, the great cities that are controlled by Babylon. And so that call of the second angel's message and the last message that called us out of Babylon called us also out of the great cities so that we can return to the places, the country, retired places and the country. Now, what if we are by ourselves? Psalm 68 says, beginning in verse 5, the Bible says, a father of the what? Fatherless. Do you know that in pure religion, pure religion always makes provisions for the needy? Whether it was the widow, whether it was the orphan that had no father or mother, heaven's plan always makes provision for the needy. And so the Bible says that he's the God of the fatherless and of the judge of the widows in his holy habitation. Verse 6, what will he do? Verse 6 says, God does what? Setteth the solitary. Now what does solitary mean? Some people think that that's the game you play on the computer uh, by yourself. That's not solitary. Solitary means to be solely. It means to be alone. So the Bible says that those people that are alone, what is he going to do? He sets them where? In families. So you know what God would do? God would take little children. If they don't understand the plan, they don't have people that can do it. And he would take older ones. And you should begin praying, Lord, set me in a family in which I can be a blessing to and they can be a blessing to me. Do you know that, it, that the Bible says that those who have silver hair have wisdom that can be shared with those that are younger? There are, there's a lost science. You know, we live in a generation today where most young people don't know anything about living in the country. This is a lost art. People, would, people would, don't know how to start fires. They don't know how to eat food. They don't know how to prepare food. They don't know how to live. And so the devil's plan, do you know that there's a generation who will live older that can help younger generation, and then the younger generation can help the older, and God will blend them together and turn the heart of the parents to the children and the children to the parents so there will be united families that can go through this crisis. Spirit Prophecy says that one or two families should come together when we move out of the center of the country and use their gifts and talents to help each other and also to minister to the cities and the surrounding areas to do evangelism to prepare the world for the coming of Jesus. We're to work them from outpost centers. We need to know the true from a true outpost and a false outpost and get into a true outpost to do this work for Jesus. Amen? We will close with one last question. My question has to do with country living. Um, I've heard the question asked a lot in here tonight. And 
you know, we're encouraged to do that. The prophet has told us to do that. But I want to know if you're going to be speaking to tonight, or if not tonight, if there'll be resources that you'll be sharing uh, in regards to country living, because many people hear about it, and then they get excited about moving out, but there's no real plan to be sustained in the country. And so I've seen people move out of the city to the country only to come back. And then when they come back, it discourages others, because then they feel like you went, but you failed, and God didn't work for you. So I, I'm, I've been around for a number of years in the church, and I'm just wondering if there is a plan now to help people to get involved in certain industries or to be able to make a livelihood in the country. Uh, well, I would say respectfully that there's always been a plan. Uh, there, God never does anything without a plan. You will find that God's plan has been in existence as long as the earth was in existence. In the book Education, there's a chapter called the Eden School. And in the chapter of the Eden School, that chapter showed the plan of how we're to live. You see, in, in the Garden of Eden, they live without buying and selling. And so what God is trying to do is to bring us back to the Eden plan. And you will find that what God has set in place actually was that our schools was to equip our young people with the training, not just with the head, but with the heart and the hand that would have allowed them to go into the country and to be able to learn how to live off the land and make it become prosperous. But what has happened is we have jettisoned the plan and have broken the blueprint that God has given us, and the result is we've turned to a liberal arts system. And in a liberal arts system, it is a system that teaches us to read and write, but not to learn how to use the brain to operate the hands. When you go to a liberal arts system, you can talk good and write good, but you don't know how to live. And that's what we need. In fact, I was talking to a farmer who was not a Seventh Adventist, who was not far from our country place, and we were talking back and forth. We was able to do some ministry, and we were talking to his family. His, his mother had rheumatoid arthritis, and we were talking about the ministry of healing. And in the midst of us talking, he opened up to me, and he said, you know what? I had a friend. He said, my friend was a, one of those New York lawyers, and he's in the South, so he has a Southern accent. And he says, it was one of those New York lawyers. And he said that he told me, because I was telling him, as we were talking, we were in the garden, I was telling him about a crisis that's getting ready to take place. He said, he said, that, he said to me, you know, friend, if I had to choose between one of you and one of them, I would choose a farmer because that other man can't get me food, but a farmer can bring me some food. You see, a liberal arts education, you know, in, in a time of a crisis, a PhD will look at you, but it won't do anything else for you. You can't eat it. It can't build you a house. It can't use your practical hands. You know that in a revolution, liberal arts is worth nothing. In a revolution, the only thing that matters are those who have learned to use the head in connection with their heart, contune with God, and their hands for the service of man. And God intended that our schools were to do this. And so what should we do? We should go back to that blueprint and begin reading the book Education and then begin to put it into practice what God has said. Now, we will have some materials that begins to talk about what a family who wants to do can see what that original plan was. I'll tell you the greatest plan you will find in the book Ministry of Healing. The chapter is called Help for the Unemployed. It says that no one has ever been able to improve upon God's plan. It says, in God's plan, everyone had a home on the land where there was sufficient ground that, it, that provided both the means and the incentive for a self-supporting livelihood. It says, no man has ever been able to improve on this plan. And it says, because we've departed from that plan, that there's so much inequality financially in the America today. And so if we go back, picking up ministry of healing, picking up education, and then beginning to go out and to put that into practice, we can learn what it takes. It's, it's a simple plan. You know, you can learn it very simply, how to live. But the problem is, we, with the liberal arts training, have learned to use what we think is logic above faith. The Bible says, the just shall live by money. Is that what it says? It says, the just shall live by what? Faith. Not presumption, but faith. I would encourage to pick up the book Country Living. I would encourage, we have a book called Your Home in the Country, and it goes through the shortest amount of books I know that goes through and picks up these things and shows us the things to consider, because we don't want to move foolishly. We want to move intelligently, but we want to move fast. Amen? All right. Let's uh, get ready to close. Our time is getting away, so I want to get ready to bring us to the last part uh, of this session. Let's go uh, in our, let's go back to the stream. We found out that there was going to be a statement that shocked the world. 
You want to go in your Bibles quickly to the book of Revelation 13. Let's go to Revelation 13. Heavenly Father, as we get ready to bring this message to a close, we ask, Lord, that you will show us, like Joseph, not only what is coming, but how to prepare. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now, of course, you know this takes a whole week, so I'm going to have to uh, go through this. All right, here is a statement that shocks the world. We remember what the statement was. The statement was that he was getting ready to step down. This had not happened in 600 what? Years. We looked at that. We remember that it talked about that there will be a deadly wound. We saw that in 1929 that that magazine, the New York Times, came out that said mortal wound healed, and most people believe that that, would, uh, that that healed the wound. But we have to go back because the Bible does say that there will be a deadly wound. Does the Bible say there will be a deadly wound? Let's look at that in Revelation 13. Let's look at it carefully again. Revelation 13, and notice what the Bible says in Revelation 13, beginning in verse 3. Are we there, amen? Let's read that together. The Bible says in verse 3, and I saw what? One of his heads, talking about the head of the beast, as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was what? Healed. And how much of the world? And all of the world wondered after the beast. So when this heal of the wound is healed, the world is going to wonder after the beast. And let me tell you something. If we wonder after the beast, are we going to be saved or lost? Are we going to be sealed with the seal of God or the mark of the beast? Those who wonder will worship the beast, and their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, according to verse 8. All right, so let's look at this. What was the deadly wound? Because in order to understand if the deadly wound was healed, we have to understand what the deadly wound was. Are you following me? Great Controversy, page 266. Let's read it together. It says, the periods here mentioned, the 40 and 2 months and 1,203 score days, are the same alike representing the time in which the church of Christ was to, ought to suffer oppression from what? Wrong. Talking about the 1260 year prophecy. It says the 1260 years of papal supremacy began in AD 538 and would therefore terminate in what year? 1798. At that time, a French army entered Rome and made the Pope a prisoner and he died in exile though a new now not, th this caused a deadly wound you'll find out that when that pope died that when that pope died this deadly wound uh, uh, when that pope uh, when the prince when the french army was sent uh, there to take the pope and put him in prison the deadly wound started and this was a separation of church and state up until 1798 the church could control the State. It had not only religious power, but it had civil power. But in 1798, it lost the civil power to control the world. The Bible says that all the deadly wound would be, we receive a deadly wound, but all the wound would be healed. And how much of the world? All of the world will wonder after the beast. Now let's watch this now. It says, at that time, a French army entered Rome, made the Pope a prisoner. Though a new Pope was soon afterward elected, the papal what? Hierarchy has never since been able to will the, what's the next two words? So the deadly wound has something in, to do with restoring the power of the papacy. And there are two great powers. There's religious power, and then there's what? Civil power. Now, brothers and sisters, in 1798, did the papacy cease to function as a church? No. It still had religious power, but the religious power no longer had the control of the state. The strong arm of the law. You see, brothers and sisters, the state is, is likened to the man. And when the church apostatized from Christ, she lost the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit, that when you receive him, that you receive power. And so as it lost the power of the Holy Spirit to enforce her rules and dogmas, then it went to the state to get power to make men do what they wanted it to do. It says that they've never since been able to wield the power, which it, what's the next word? Before possess. So when it, what was the power that it had before? It had not only religious power, but it had civil power over how much of the world? All the world. So when the deadly wound is healed, it must again have religious power and civil power over how much? Because then the Bible says the deadly wound will be healed in all of the world would wonder after the beast. 
So a great controversy tells us, because some people say, you know, some people say, some people say that in 1929 the, the daily wound was healed. Some people say in the 1870s the daily wound was healed. People all throughout. But here, this book, Great Controversy, written in 1888, then in revised 1911, and still she says that the daily wound was not healed. Now let's go a little further and see what happened. In fact, we're going to understand it. Now, this is a Catholic encyclopedia, and we'll let Catholic historians tell you the same thing. Now, this Catholic encyclopedia says, quote, the temporal sovereignty of the Pope ended during the what? Now, this is history. During the French Revolution, when the French army did what? Captured Rome what year? 1798. It says he was exiled, he was in prison, it received the deadly wound because it lost its power. Do you see that? Still a church, but it lost its civil power to the control of the world in the year 1798. That's when it received the deadly wound, but the Bible says that deadly wound will be healed. When the wound is healed, it's too late to get ready. Are you following me? All right, let's go a little further. Here's the French general, came in, took the Pope uh, prisoner, Berthier, did that. This is history. But do you know that a book was written, written called Prisoner of the Vatican? How many have ever heard of that book called Prisoner of the Vatican? Let me see the hand if you ever heard of that book. Prisoner of the Vatican. You ever heard of that book? Or I see a hand there? Let's watch this now. The Prisoner of the Vatican, what is that? Here's a man who is the, his name is David Kurtzer. He wrote the book. He's a famous uh, uh, univer, uh, university professor. He understands history, very famous for his understanding of Jewish history and also other books he's written. He wrote the book called Prisoner of the Vatican. And in this book, he documents something. Because do you know that we're told that if you study historically, it said that the Pope was as a prisoner in the Vatican for a long time. I want you to notice what happens now. Watch what it says. You can find this from Encyclopedia. This is just Wikipedia, but it's, the book says the same thing. But look what it says. It says, a prisoner in the what? Vatican, or a prisoner of the Vatican, Vatican is how Pope Pius the uh, Ninth uh, was de described following the capture of what? Rome by the armed forces of the kingdom of what? Italy on September 20th, 18 what? Now you have to understand what happened. They said the same thing. Do you know that in 1870, the papacy was in a lower position than in 1798? In 1798, the papacy lost the power over the civil powers of the world, but she still retained her civil power over Italy. Over what? The Vatican was still under the control, hence the name of the book, Prisoner in the Vatican. But do you know that in 1870, because of the revolution that took place, the, 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 the national revolution in Italy, it ousted him, ousted the power over Rome, over Italy, and now Rome lost the power, not only of the world, but it lost the power of Italy. So in 1870, was the wound healed, yes or no? The wound was actually in the worse position than in 1798. Now can you imagine? In 1870, there was a little woman with a, third, a little less than a third education writing that the deadly wound was going to be healed. Everybody in the world thought that that was fanatical. They said the Pope would never come back. America had already been established, trying to get away establishing a church without a Pope and a government without a king, having a Protestant and Republican government. They said this is taking off and the Pope would never come back to power. But the Bible says the deadly wound would be what? Healed. Can you imagine that when the great controversy was written, the papacy was at its lowest point, and the prophet says, I don't care what anybody says, it's coming back. She had no papers to plagiarize from because no papers would ever said that Rome was coming back. Let's go a little further. So what's happening? Dead Luon. In 1798, she lost the power of the world civil power. Are you following me? But in, that was step one in 1798. But step two to the deadly wound was that in 1870, she lost not only power of the world, but she lost power over what? Italy. So in order for the deadly wound to be healed, she must regain first control of the power over what? Italy, which would be the stepping stone for her to then get power over the what? World. So the question is, in 1870, did she ever get back control of Italy? When did she get back control of Italy? What does it take to heal the wound? She has to get back control of Italy. She has to get back control of the world. This is what happened. So we find out that in 1929, indeed, she got back control over, not the world, but over what? Italy. Let's see that. Here's the deadly wound. Now here, a pact was being signed. 
Anybody know that, uh, who is talking about this latter impact? Was between Mussolini and the Roman Catholic Church. This is when the paper said that the wound was healed, 1929. Now, if you look in history, this is what it will tell you about this daily wound. The wound was not healed, but the healing does what? Amen. Begins. Now, let's watch this now. Here's the encyclopedia. It says, the laddering treaty was one of the what? Laddering pacts. Now, you better watch this now. Watch it. Don't go to sleep. I'm not just showing you pictures. You better watch this, brothers and sisters. Are you following me? Yeah. It says, the laddering pacts of 1929 or agreements, uh, 1929, between the kingdom of what? Not the world, but the kingdom of what? Italy and the Holy See. Talking about the Roman Catholic Church. Now, when did they sign this pact in 1929? Look what it says. Sign on what? February what? 11, 1929. So the healing began at a particular time. Is that right? When did the healing of this womb begin? February 11. 1929. So the wound was not healed, but the healing began. In 1929, she didn't gain control of the world, but she regained what she lost in 1870. She regained control of Italy. Does that make sense? But in order for the deadly wound to be healed and all the world to run after the beast, she must regain control of the world like she once had. Are you following me? Then persecution will start off. Now, my brothers and sisters, this means that the deadly wound begins healing on February 11, what? 1929. This is prophetic, brothers and sisters. Now, do you know what that is right there? This is the Vatican. Lightning bolts came out of the sky and hit the top of the Vatican, just like that. Do you know that three lightning bolts came out of the sky and hit the top of the Vatican? You know what caused it to happen? Watch now. It says, a lightning strikes St. Peter's Dome at the Vatican on what day? February 11, 2013. Did you get it or did you miss it? I want you to understand what happened now. Watch now, brothers and sisters. Do you know what caused the lightning to come down? The Pope Benedict XVI on February 11 stood up and said, I am going to resign. On February 11, within an hour, one hour, less than an hour after Pope made that statement that shocked the world, less than an hour later, three lightning bolts hit the Vatican and gets the attention of the entire world. Letting us know that something is happening. God is saying, please wake up, seven heaven is, something is going on. Prophetically, something takes place. And my brothers and sisters, it says today he will resign. It says, Pope Benedict XVI announced today he will resign as the leader of the world's 1.1 billion Catholics. And he says he's going to make that resign on February 28th. But he stood up and said he's going to resign. What day? Now, why is that important, brothers and sisters? That means that this has something to do now. Now, what day did the deadly wound begin healing? February 11, what? 1929. What day did Pope Benedict step down? What day? February 11, 1929. What is it telling us, brothers and sisters? It's telling us that this stepping down of the Pope was setting in motion that which will cause not the healing to begin, but the healing to come to what? So we're getting ready to see the finishing of the healing of the daily wound. Now, how long did that take? Brothers and sisters, that means the daily wound that started in 1929 is getting ready to end as this new pope is coming in. This is prophetic. This took 84 years for this to be in progress, but everything is happening step by step. And there's no question that when this new pope was elected, when that pope stepped down, if this pope had not stepped down, Pope Francis could have never came in. This stepping down on February 11 was a prophetic indication that let this new pope come in, and this new pope that came in, he's called the Pope of the New World because now for the first time you have an American pope. Even no matter what part of America, whether it's South America, North America, Central America, you have an American pope that for the first time bridges Italy with America for the first time. They said he's a strange pope, and as soon as he came in, he began doing what the prophet said he would do. Look at this. He came in. Can you see that picture? Can you see that? Here's a man with a deformed head. This man with a deformed head, they said here that no one wanted to touch him, but the Pope went over to him and kissed him. All of a sudden, they said, this has to be Jesus. They said, this has to be someone just like Christ, and they began to parallel. Remember when Jesus touched the leper, the most the dreaded disease of the East, and he, and he touched the leper when nobody wanted to touch him? This has to be just like Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, brother, says, you better watch it. He came on the scene as the, folk, the first openly professed Jesuit Pope. Then... 
He does an act that no pope has ever done in the history of pope. And I, and I make up a word, in the history of popacity. No pope has ever done. He stepped down, he went to the inmates and began to start washing their feet. He said, I'm just like us, I'm humble. Someone says, oh, this is a lovely pope. You better watch what this means, brothers and sisters. Then he kisses the feet of these different men. When he was elected, he stayed. This is, the, 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 this is like the projects of the Vatican City. He would not live. You know, most popes, they had palaces that they lived in in the Vatican. He said, I'm not going to live in that. He says, we need to save our money and we need to use it right. You know, the pope, he won't even, he won't even drive a regular car. The pope has a pope mobile. It used to be a limousine. You know, he doesn't have a limousine. He has a Ford Focus. He said, I'm not going to use the money this way. He said, we need to use the money properly. Because remember now, this pope is saying that we need to reform on our economical policies. Then it said Pope Francis plans to drive around Vatican City at the will of a pope mobile. There's a lot like him, frugal, clad in white, and with a fair bit of malice. It's not even a new Ford Focus. One of the old priests donated that uh, Ford Focus to him that has heavy mileage on it, and he said, we're going to use it that way. You know, the Pope before, they used to have the red shoes and the carpet and the, and the Pope mobiles riding. He said, I'm in that Ford Focus. He, even when he was elected, he got into the buses with the regular common people. You better understand something. The devil is slick. Someone says, you know, the one seven evidence, I heard it. It was put on our papers, and somebody said, somebody says, well, this is a good pope. Even though he's a pope, it's good because he's feeding the hungry. He's clothing the naked. The Bible says, even if I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profit of nothing. Now, my brothers and sisters, you better understand something. There's a reason why this is going on. What's the reason? Great Controversy 234 says, the first triumphs of the Reformation passed, Rome summoned what? new forces hoping to accomplish his destruction at this time the order of the jesuits was created now this is a book great controversy the prophet says and that's amazing in the books we're passing out that we're trying to give hope to the world these chapters were strangely removed it says hoping to accomplish the destruction the order of the jesuits was created the most cruel unscrupulous and powerful of all the champions of popery. Now, my brother, you must understand something. You know, this pope, this pope is a Jesuit. Now, this says, cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason and conscious, holy silence. They knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order. And no duty but to do what? extend its power. Now, if the duty of the Jesuit was to extend the power of the papacy, and now you made him the Pope, do you think that the power is getting ready to be completely returned back to the papacy? Watch this now. Great Controversy goes on to say, page 235, it says, when appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of what? Sanctity. Visiting what? What has this Pope has done? He's visited what? Prison. And hospitals, where's he been going? Kissing feet and hospital, touching the deformed. You better understand what it's about. Great Controversy says, visiting hospitals, ministering to the sick and to the what? Poor. Is this what this Pope is doing? Yes or no? Yes. Professing to have renounced the world and bearing the sacred name of Jesus, who went about doing good, but under his blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. You know what Great Controversy says? It says you better understand something, that under that appearance of the chameleon is which willing to change is the invariable venom of the serpent. You better understand something. Something's getting ready to take place in America. And in Maryland, you know that this is Mary's land. You better watch out, brothers and sisters. It says, and bearing the name, it goes on and says, it says it concealed. It was fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the means. They establish what? Colleges for the sons of princes and nobles and schools for the common people and the children of the uh, Protestant parents were drawn into the observance of what? Popish rites. The Jesuits did what? Rapidly spread themselves over Europe. Now watch. And everywhere they went, there followed a what? Revival of what? Now my brother and sister, do you think that if the Jesuit is the Pope himself, if, if he's leading out in the papacy, do you think that there's going to be a revival of the papacy and the returning of her power, yes or no? This is not accidental that it happened this way. 
My brother says, this is the gospel of Christ that enables inheritance to meet danger. Jesuitism inspired his followers with a fanaticism that enabled them to endure like dangers and to oppose the power of truth and all the weapons of what? There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to what? This is a disguise that's getting ready to be ripped off by one who believes in the third angel's message. It says, vow to perpetual poverty. This is why he won't drive in a limousine. He's a Jesuit. This is why he won't spend his time and his money. That way he's vow, vow to perpetual poverty and humility. It was their studied aim to secure what? Wealth and power to be devoted to two things. Number one, to the overthrow of what? You know what you can say as a 2014 check. Protestantism is over with. What else? This Pope came on the scene. Do you know that he's uniting all of the world religions right now? This is number two. And the what? Reestablishment of papal supremacy. This is going on right now. The Bible says he shall receive a deadly wound, and the deadly wound will be what? Healed, and all of the world will wonder after the beast. That tells us that we're getting to that condition right now. Everything is taking place. And when this Pope came to the scene, we can see him fulfilling this order just like it says in the Washington, Washington Post. I wonder where that is. George Bergoglio, the first what? Jesuit Pope known for his pastoral work. You must understand something. If you were playing cards, and I know you're not playing them now because you've been converted, amen? But when you used to play cards and you played them, when does a man tip his hand? When the game is, do you know, brothers and sisters, this game is over. The papacy, for the first time, has tipped his hand. They believe that it's time to finish this work. The papacy is in position right now. The only thing that needs to happen is that the papacy cannot heal its own wound, brothers and sisters. There's another beast, Revelation 13, because this pope was asked. I can't read this now because my time is getting away, but I want to get to you one more part before we close. And I want you to see this. They asked the pope in the New York Times, they asked him, what do you think? And he wrote a book, and they asked him about his book, and they picked out one part, and they said, you talked about leisure in your book. What do you mean? One passage in the book, at first glance, rather slight, ends up insinuating a radical note into the proceedings. Pope Francis believes that we must indeed, that God is calling us to what? I wonder what he means, relax. Responding to the question, the Pope said, do we need to, we need to rediscover the meaning of leisure? Pope replies, together with the culture of work, there must be a culture of what? Leisure. To put it another way, people who work must take time to what? Relax. To be with their families. I wonder what he means when he says we need a family day. To enjoy themselves, to read, to listen to music, to play a sport, but this is being destroyed in large part by the elimination. I wonder what he's talking about. Elimination of what? By the elimination of the Sabbath rest day. More and more people work on what? Sundays as a consequence of the competitiveness imposed by consumer society. In such case, he concludes, work ends up dehumanizing people. He says the only way to save society is that we must now learn to relax on the Sunday Sabbath. Everything is in position in Rome. You know what our problem is? There's one more beast that must do it. Revelation 13 verse 11 says that he's not going to heal his own wound. What does verse 11 say? Revelation 13 verse 11 tells us something else. It says in front cover of Time magazine, why the Pope what? Loves America. Now you know why he loves America, don't you? Why, if you're in one of these cities of our world, right here in Maryland, if you were to go down uh, here in Maryland, if you were to go down to one of the streets in Baltimore, you go down to Cherry Hill, and you go into the back alley there. You know, my mother's from Baltimore. I grew up a large time in this area. My father from D.C. grew up in this area. And I remember, brothers and sisters, listen to me. When you go down to these seats to where we live at, the police don't even go. And in these cities, in the back cities, in the alleyways, if a man is stabbed to death, blood oozing out, 
And he's on the ground, all of a sudden he looks like he's getting ready to die in his own blood, and somebody comes over to that man, and they go to him and make sure that they're there, and they, they go to him and start nursing his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and heals that man's wound. Is that man going to love him or hate him? This is why the Pope loves America, because he knows that America is going to heal the wound of the papacy. In Revelation 13, verse 11, look what it says. The Bible says, and I beheld a what? Could you please help me in turn? I want you to turn in the slide. I know I'm not going to be able to get through where I want it, and I want to get ready to bring it to a close. So if you take the slide and go to 713. Go to take your slide and go to 713. We're not going to be able to take the time to go as much as I want it. But let's go to 713. Now, the Bible says, in Revelation 13, 11, it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the what? Earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a what? As a dragon. That's America. That's when she applies and enforces a Sunday law and the return of persecution and the pressure. What is that going to do? Verse 12 says, and he exercised of how much? All the power of the first beast before him and cause of the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was what? Now would you back up for me and go to 673. Go to 673 and I'll move it. Thank you. Whose deadly wound was healed. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means that the second beast heals the wound of the first beast. That second beast is the United States of America. Something must happen in America to complete the deadly wound. The papacy did its job. It has control of Italy. But something must happen in America, but America and, and Rome would never come together. Oh, they're on the screen. Obama and Francis warmly greeted one another outside the paper library. Now notice what happens. Look now. This says, wonderful meeting you. I am a great what? Does it sound like he's getting ready to wonder? Yes or no? Thank you, sir. Thank you. You know, this happened March 27, 2014. That's this year. Just a few weeks ago. It says they continue there. They start thanking. Guess what the main purpose of their meeting was? You know that most popes that the presidents didn't have much to agree. That the last pope, President Obama, didn't have much to agree on, but this pope and Obama have a meeting ground. You know what the meeting ground is? Economy. You know, when he went to Vatican, he started asking him about what to do with the poor. Anybody know those two people? Who are those two people right there? Now, you don't know who they are in Maryland. You don't know who they are. Right? This is Bonner, and this is Pelosi, Sister Pelosi, let's call her that. <laughs> now, my brothers and sisters, this tells us that they represent both the House and the Senate. Both the House and the Senate. They control Congress. This is where laws are passed. Right there, right here in Washington, D.C., where laws are going to be passed for the federal government, right here. And what did they do? Listen, brothers and sisters, do you know what Spirit of Prophecy says in Great Controversy? It says that we will see that the papacy will come to the aid of Protestants and in helping them to establish a Sunday law. Do you know that something that they did that met history in America? You know what they asked for, don't you? Look at this. House Speaker John Bonner invites the Pope Francis to speak to what? Congress. He said, I want you to come, 2015, next year. He said, I want you to come to Congress. Amazing, the General Conference session, what year? And you think that the General Conference session, you know that they say the main thing is about women's ordination. That's not the main thing. You, you think it's the main thing. You study history. I was going to show you, but our time got away. What I was going to show you, brother and sister, if you study history, every time that that, that you had women's ordination and moved through a church, that was never the real issue. There always the issue led to the indoctrination and the ordination of homosexual ministers. Every Christian, you get on the web and find out, every Christian church historically that have ordained women ministers have also ordained homosexual ministers. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. You know that, that every, the, the, the social predominant condition before the nation reaches the limit is homosexuality. That was true in Greece, Rome, Solomon and Gomorrah, that we're at the limit in America. Is this the case? That means that we must be at the limit right now. My brothers and sisters, do you know I told you about it. I can't go through it and I showed you. We told you about the twin institutions. Is that right? First one's already been born. That means the next one of the son-in-law is getting ready to come. Do you know that it's sweeping right now? This homo legislation already has 18 states. 
They're moving for a program talking about give me 40. We have the whole federal government. And it's moving. Seven in litigation right now. 25 states that are already in the bag. And these others are moving quickly. And all they need, that's almost a majority vote, is getting ready. They want to do that, then bring it to the federal court. And my brothers and sisters, we can see that it's moving in the direction. First, counterfeit marriage, and then counterfeit Sabbath. We're here, brothers and sisters. And then all this is coming together. They brought him in. It says, Pope Bonner and Pelosi invite Pope Francis to Congress. Look what it says. It says, if he accepts, no pope or religious leader that serves as a head of state has ever addressed Congress, according to the U.S. House Historian's Office. This breaks historical record. My brothers and sisters, this has happened to no other generation. Didn't it happen to your grandparents? Didn't happen to them? No. This generation shall not pass. This is it, brothers and sisters. And the last thing that's going to happen in America, Revelation 13 says in verse 16, and that no man might what? Buy or sell. Would you jump down back to verse to 713, please? I want to bring it to close. 713. 713. The Bible says, and that no man can buy or what? Sell. Now listen to me, brothers and sisters. That means except he have the mark of the there's a relationship between money and the mark of the beast. The devil knows of this relationship. So if you want to understand the mark of the beast, you've got to understand money. The Bible says the love of money is the root of what? Not some evil, how much evil? 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10. So the, is the mark of the beast evil, yes or no? Then what is at the foundation of the mark of the beast? The love of... So the son-in-law is going to be passed for the love of... Now listen to me. Is that economy in place where no man can buy and sell tonight? Is it in place, yes or no? Someone says no. If you say no, let me see your hand. I see a few hands. If you say yes, let me see your hand. Now, that wasn't everybody's hand. Either you're sleeping or you're not listening. Amen. <laughs> so I asked the third question. No, 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 excuse me. Let me ask the third question, then I'll say that. If you don't know, let me see your hand. No, then you must be sleeping. Amen. <laughs> uh, but, that's not, but listen, the principle is this. Listen. I'll tell you the truth. That economy is not in place tonight. How do we know? Tonight, whether you are an atheist or an Adventist, you can buy or sell. Right? Tonight, whether you're a Buddhist or a Baptist, without the mark of the beast, you can buy or sell. Whether you're a Muslim or a Mason, tonight you can buy and sell. But the Bible says there's coming a time that no man can buy or sell save he have the mark of the beast or his name or the number of his name. Revelation 16 and 17. Question. If that system, if that system is not in place tonight, would you go? Hey, all right, praise God. If that system is not in place tonight, then what must happen to our present economy? This present economy must collapse so that this new system can be introduced at the passing of a national Sunday law. Now, someone says that could never happen in the United States of America. Could the economy collapse? Now, I'm tempted to tell you about this collapse all right now and tonight, but I can't do it. I'm going to close it right here. I'm going to close. We're told, my brother and sister, that there's going to come a social crisis when this economy collapses. This talks about that. It says when the economy goes into reverse, as it inevitably will do, America is going to have a serious social mess. Understand? How many have ever, ever heard of Occupy Wall Street? Now, you know about it here, don't you? Yes, you, yes, you know about it. You know it's getting ready to get bigger. Do you know that, 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 was, just a, that was just a little picture of what's getting ready to take place? Anybody ever been to a beach and you see how the water goes back, the wave comes in, and then the wave backs up? And a man that doesn't know about waves, he gets happy. He says the storm is gone. But if you go and see a tsunami, you'll recognize that when that tsunami is getting ready to send the biggest wave to come crashing down, that when it recedes back, it recedes back further in, uh, inland than it's ever seen, and the tide goes back. And the, some, you know what some people do? Because they don't understand the nature of waves, they go out deeper into the water. Let me tell you something, people after 2008, they thought that the crisis was over and they went deeper into the economy, deeper into debt, deeper into the city. They said, it's over now. The Federal Reserve says it's over. I hope you don't believe that. I say respectfully, but that Federal Reserve have never told you the truth. How are you going to start believing them now? Now, my brothers and sisters, listen to what the prophet says. 
It says, at the same time, anarchy is seeking to sweep away how much? All law, not only divine, but human. The centralizing of what? Wealth and power. What in one word do you call a centralizing of wealth and power? In one word, what do you call it? Monopoly. Remember that name. What is it called? Now, if you understand Monopoly, you know we're in the final generation. Remember that name. The Monopoly is the name of the game. It says, by the way, if you studied the history of Monopoly, well, that's a whole other story. It says, the vast combination for the enriching of the few at the expense of the many. Now, what's going to be the result? Because the monopolies have already been formed. What's going to be the result? It says, the combinations of the what? Poor classes for the defense of their interests and claims, the spirit of what? Unrest, of riot, and what else? Bloodshed. What three things? Unrest, riot, and what? Bloodshed. Can you imagine what that would look like in Maryland? Un unrest, riot, and bloodshed? Why, well, that's short of that. It's called a revolution. It says, the worldwide dissemination of the same teachings that led to the what? Now, how many know about the French Revolution? I'm going to tell you something. There have been many revolutions throughout history, but none have been as bloody as the French Revolution. The Chinese Revolution, bloody. The uh, 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 Russian Revolution, bloody. The Mexican Revolution, bloody. The Cuban Revolution, bloody. The American Revolution, bloody. But none were as bloody and vile as the French Revolution. They would take children, just chop their heads off just in the streets. They'll take a dance and they will be starved, no food. And do you know what set off the French Revolution? An economic crisis. And the prophet says that what happened in the French Revolution, it says, all are tending to involve not just America, but how much? The whole world in a struggle similar to that which involves France. Did, have you noticed that there's a worldwide revolution going on right now? In Cairo, Egypt. We saw it in Africa, we see it in Southern Asia, in Northern Africa, we see it in Europe, we see it all across, and let me tell you something, it's coming to a country near you. Do you know right now, you have, a, you have, as, you have problems in just day-to-day -day life. What's going to happen in Maryland when a revolution breaks out? Someone says, I'm going to get in my car and get out of the city. Have you seen the traffic in Maryland? <laughs> Why, you can't even jump in your car today and get out of the city. What makes you think you're going to do it in a revolution? Watch it now. I'm going to pass through this. It says, it's talking, about the, talking about the coming back of the labor unions. You know that when Obama came in, President Obama respectfully, one of the first thing he did with three executive orders was brought back the labor unions, just as the prophet says. I can't go back and talk about it now, but i got to get ready to bring it to close. But it says the Protestant world will have set up an idle Sabbath in the place where God's Sabbath should be, and they are treading in the footsteps of the papacy. For this reason I see not the desire, but the what? That's optional, yes or no? I see the necessity of the people of God doing what? Moving out of the cities into retired country places where they may cultivate the land and raise their own produce. Thus they may bring their children up with simple, helpful habits. I see the necessity of making what? Haste to get all things ready for the crisis. Then it says, again and again, the Lord has instructed our people to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions for in the future what? The problem of buying and selling will be a very serious problem. You know, brother and sister, very soon the people, their jobs are not going to mean nothing. They're going to throw their money in the street. I, it, now, we're going to have some DVDs. I can't explain it all, but we have some DVDs that will go through this in detail. But I'm going to tell you this. Your money today in 2014 is worth zero. I'm a, it's on the DVDs. Goes to the newspapers, explains it, and the only reason why your money is still being used is because the common people don't know that their money has been worth nothing, that they've been robbed. 401k doesn't exist. Your retirement fund doesn't exist. The only thing you will get from the bank is an IOU. That right there will make a revolution. <laughs> a man has worked for 40 years inside Maryland and D.C., waking up at 4 and 5, getting on subways and buses and transit, and then all of a sudden, after 40 or 50 years of work, he sits down to retire, to eat and to live on what he has, and then you tell him you don't have nothing for him. Why, if you meet somebody from Maryland, you know that's a revolution. And so, my brothers and sisters, this is the condition, and if you didn't have Christ, you would have a revolution. But my brothers and sisters, the world doesn't have Christ. And this says, I warn you again and again, get out of this. Why? The work of the people of God is to prepare for the events of the future which will soon come upon them with what? 
That means it's going to happen so fast. You're going to say, well, I thought that we were supposed to know this, but that Sunday law is going to pass so quickly. Not because we didn't know, but because we did not study the signs, the indication. It says, what's going to happen in the world? Gigantic what? What's the name of the game? What? Now, if you know how to win and lose Monopoly, we can close our session tonight. How do you win Monopoly? Anybody play Monopoly? Anybody play Monopoly? I'm going to say, don't act like you, you didn't ever play Monopoly. You know you play Monopoly. Now, never mind the game was built on selfishness. But how? I used to love it. I used to play it before I knew better. I'm playing, be buying up, reading Railroad Park Place, everything. How do you win the game? Monopoly. How do you lose the game? Bankrupt. What indicates that the game is getting ready to reach the limit? When all of the players become what? So if we were to begin to see in the cities of America bankruptcy, we would recognize that the game is almost over. Men will bind themselves together in unions. A few men will come and grasp all the means. Trade unions will be formed. Those who refuse to join these unions will be marked men. That sounds like monopoly. Is that right? That's revolution. That's getting ready to take place. Now, my brothers and sisters, if you look at what's going on now, do you know what the greatest monopoly is? Anybody know what the greatest monopoly is? The greatest monopoly, watch now, is a central bank. Here's an encyclopedia. Watch what it says. A central bank, reserve bank, monetary authority, etc. It says, it says, in contrast to a commercial bank, a central bank possesses a, a what? Now, do you know the prophet was talking about this right now? A monopoly. It says that a central bank, now what are some examples of this central bank monopoly? Let's see some examples of this. It says, it says the example of this, examples are the, Federal Reserve of the United States. Do you know that the Federal Reserve System is the largest monopoly in the world? If you read about how it was established on Jekyll Island, I've been there and I've seen and studied the history of this. My brother says this is prophetic. And let me tell you something. That game that started back in 1913 has reached its limit in this generation. It's over. When that economy collapses, we're going to see nothing but revolution. And they're going to think that the only way to stop the revolution is that we must return back to God in the form of a national Sunday law. This is it, brothers and sisters. If ever there was a time to get ready, the time is now. Do you want to run to Jesus? Yes. Are you happy you were here tonight? Yes. Did you learn anything? Yes. Do you want some more? Yes. Now, we're going to have materials tonight that will talk about this combination. Let me tell you something. Everybody needs to understand this health work and this third angel's message. It's time to get ready. Amen. Let's say a prayer tonight. If there's someone here tonight that says, Lord, I want to be ready for the coming of Jesus. Do you want to be ready? Can you see the handwriting on the wall? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it is clear the time is almost finished. That this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled and Lord, we don't want to selfishly get ready ourselves, but first we want to spend time knowing you, but then, dear God, we want to reach out to help others who have never heard and those in our denomination who have never known what's getting ready to break upon us as an overwhelming surprise. But Lord, how can we help others if we don't first start with turning our hearts over to thee? Our family, our finances, our time, our energy, so that we can become ready to meet Jesus. I pause the prayer. If there's someone here tonight that says, Lord, I need Jesus like never before, and I need him to help guide me. I don't know how to make all these steps, but the Bible says if you acknowledge me, I will direct your path. Do you want God to help you? If that's your desire tonight, just raise your hand. You want to start over tonight like never before. You're saying, I need Jesus. Do we need Jesus, brothers and sisters? For without Jesus, we can do. Heavenly Father, grant every hand the love of Christ. May we make a decision that we're going to spend less time in the television, in Facebook, in Instagram, in the world, in nothingness, and we're going to start spending more time opening up our Bibles, getting on our knees, bringing the family together, and studying with those who have never heard this truth. 
Help us, Lord, so that when this crisis breaks, we will be safe in Jesus and then be able to use to help many others before it is too late. Thank you for this warning, dear God. Even if we never hear another message, help us to take it serious. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for a silent moment of meditation as we get ready to dismiss.